Now, I want to tell you about Tony Michaels, who is our speaker. The cat is, sorry, he is very much a Californian. I was going to say the cat is a Californian, but he's a Californian. I think he was born in Chicago. And from Chicago, his family moved to San Jose. Um, he received his BA in politics at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And he actually was a student here at Santa Barbara for two quarters when he was an undergraduate. So this is kind of like coming home party for him. Um, and he was telling me he went up to Halama Beach and he enjoyed Halama Beach and he's been walking around Santa Barbara enjoying it. Um, and so it's, it's a great pleasure to host him uh, here um, uh, at UC Santa Barbara, which played a very small part in his education. After completing his BA at UC Santa Cruz, he went on to Stanford University, where he received his PhD. And since 1998, he has been teaching at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he is the George L. Mose uh, Professor of American Jewish History. Um, he is the editor of a very fine collection of texts of Jewish radicals, simply entitled Jewish Radicals, a documentary history, uh, published by the uh, New York University Press in 2012, an extraordinary book uh, entitled A Fire in Their Hearts, Yiddish Socialists in New York, uh, that was published in 2005 by Harvard University Press, and which won a very distinguished award, the Sallow um, Baron Prize for the Best First Book in Jewish Studies from the American Academy of Jewish Research. And he is the co-editor with his colleague uh, Mitchell Hart of the eighth volume of the Cambridge History of Judaism. And you can, I mean, it's very expensive, but you can get a digital copy. <laughs> and if you read the digital copy, uh, Tony and his colleague um, Mitchell Hart they take up one of the most vexing problems that we have in Jewish history, which is, when did the Jews become modern? And I think that their first 15 pages uh, is well worth the cost of the digital issue of the book. I don't know about the printed issue, issue but it's an extraordinary uh, argument that they develop. Let me just note that uh, this introduction is really exquisite about the course of modern Jewish uh, life and history um, from the 19th century to the present. Um, in fact, it's one of the, the finest introductions to modern Judaism that I've read. Um, in addition to these great uh, volumes, he has also written extensively on socialism and communism uh, in the American Jewish uh, and also the Yiddish speakers in Europe uh, and the United States. Um, so it is a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Tony to speak on uh, uh, Jews and Revolution. Please welcome Tony Michaels. Richard, thank you for that extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, generous introduction. Um, uh, I don't know if I've ever had a more uh, generous introduction. Uh, I do have to correct something you said that uh, about UC Santa Barbara playing a minor role in my education. I actually played an important role in my education, even though I was here for only two quarters. And that's because I took two courses with Richard Hecht when I was here. Now, now Richard didn't know me then or, or since. I'll tell you how we reconnected in a second. But I took his course on the history of Jerusalem. Uh, religion, uh, if I, the title I think was Religion and Politics in the City of Jerusalem uh, with Roger Friedland. Uh, and that was my introduction to Zionism in an academic study in Israel, in the history of Israel. And then the next semester I took his course on the history of anti-Semitism 
with um, Albert Lindemann in the history department. And, and those were uh, two, uh, the, both courses played a very important role in my trajectory, even at UC Santa Cruz and beyond. So, so I, I, I absolutely have to correct you on that. These are my two, first two courses I took in Jewish history. Um, and, they were with, and they were with uh, uh, Richard. I can still, still tell you what was assigned in many of those books. I still have those books, I have all of them. Um, also, I want to add that uh, there were, um, when I was here for those two quarters, this is back in the fall of 86 and the winter of 87, that's when I was here. And um, I can tell you who Richard brought out to speak. Uh, Amos Oz, the great Israeli novelist, uh, Maron Benvenisti, who was the former associate mayor, a deputy mayor of Jerusalem, Yehuda Latani from, I think, the Jerusalem Post came to speak. Deborah Lipstadt, for, I don't know where she was at the time, but she spoke, I think, on Holocaust denial, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there was probably one other person uh, who came. That was all in a two-quarter period, and it meant a lot to me because uh, not only were they great lectures, but Santa Cruz didn't offer it. We were too far off the beaten path, or they didn't have the right faculty bringing these kinds of figures in. So, um, so Santa Barbara, even though I was here just briefly, was really uh, um, a wonderful and highly educational experience for me. So I want to thank Richard for that. We didn't reconnect until um, uh, uh, April, March, uh, when he was at University of Wisconsin. I introduced myself and said, you know, you were a professor of mine uh, over 20 years ago. Um, oh, and before, I also want to thank Maeve DeVoy, who, um, uh, despite her, com uh, her, her uh, almost complete divorce from technology, managed to put everything together very quickly and efficiently, and it's been wonderful to, to work with her. Um, so my topic this evening is Jews and Revolution, the American Jewish Experience, and if the title seems somewhat strange, it may be because we, or American Jewish historians, don't tend to think of revolution in, connected with the, in connection with the United States. Revolution is a phenomenon usually among scholars of American Jews associated with Europe and is seen as a key difference between the experiences of Jews on both sides of the Atlantic. Jews in Europe experience revolution one way or another, but the United States, ex the experience in the United States is often per, uh, um, uh, per portrayed in a very different way. The story of American Jews as presented in most textbooks, documentary films, and museum exhibits um, runs something like this. Jews immigrated to the United States. They struggled to earn a living. Uh, they uh, achieved affluence over time, uh, adjusted to social norms in ways consistent with Jewish traditions, values, and interests, and along the way built a variegated ethnic community um, uh, in the United States. Variegated but stable, coherent. The story, in other words, of American Jews has been told as one of Americanization understood in the way I just described, in linear and progressive terms. Right? That's, in a nutshell, the way American Jewish history has been uh, depicted in the big frame, in the big sweep of things. Now, without denying the importance of these themes, I want to present another way of understanding the development of Jewish life in the United States uh, specifically the politics of American Jews, but my comments aren't limited to politics. And this is through the prism of revolution. And the idea I want to propose this evening, uh, for the first time actually, this is something I'm just airing for the first time, um, is that revolutions have shaped American Jewish history since the 18th century. Um, and when you look through the prism of revolution, which is what I want to propose tonight, the pr pr prism of revolution is a way of understanding American Jewish history, um, different themes uh, get highlighted. Uh, themes of tension and conflict, rupture, uh, themes of utopian as aspirations, um, uh, some of which failed, some of which succeeded in one extent or another. Um, these are a different set of themes that I think come out in the uh, uh, American Jewish experience when it's viewed through the prism of revolution. And I have to say, this comes out of a current book I'm close to finishing on the Jewish engagement, the American Jewish engagement with the Russian Revolution. So as in thinking about the Russian Revolution and what it has meant for Jews in the United States, that I started thinking about revolution more broadly. And I came to think of the Russian Revolution as actually one of a number that have framed American Jewish history 
um, uh, uh, again, in the broad suite. So I'm going to speak about five revolutions. Obviously, I can't go into great depth with each one in the interest of time. In fact, I should. Um, Richard, can I rely on you to do that if, 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 if I start to go too long? The five revolutions are the 17, American Revolution, the uh, 1848 revolutions uh, of Europe, especially the German and Austro-Hungarian revolutions, the failed 1905 Russian Revolution, uh, the, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and finally, the creation of the State of Israel in 1848. Uh, 1948. All right, so uh, again, I'm going to try uh, to, to uh, so I will organize my, my talk around those revolutions. Now, the first and the most obvious one is the American Revolution, and it's the one that we're most familiar with. It's the one in which um, scholars of American Jews have paid a, a great deal of attention to, and for good reason. Um, this is the revolution that, of course, established the country and brought full civil and political rights to Jews um, with that revolution. Um, it's the first, in other words, it's the revolution that brought emancipation to Jews, civil political equality to Jews uh, e quite, quite smoothly with no great debates, uh, at least not at the federal level, and it was the moment in which Jews became citizens. Uh, the Two important aspects of uh, the Constitution that established civil and political equality for Jews, Article 6 in the First Amendment um, said this, Article 6 forbids religion as a religious oath or test as a requirement for holding government. Uh, in other words, Jews could participate fully in American politics and government without conversion to Christianity. That's, import that's the important thing about Article 6 as it comes to Jews. And the First Amendment um, forbids Congress from making any law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, to quote the First Amendment, meaning that the United States government can't tell Jews or anyone else how to practice Judaism. It can't establish which branch of Judaism, I'm just speaking Ju in terms of Judaism, not other religions, it can't determine which branch of Judaism is legitimate, which is not, what, um, whether or not uh, Jews can practice Judaism and so forth. Um, now, in practical terms, at the moment, the Constitution uh, did not mean a great deal to Jews only because there were so few Jews in the United States at the time of the Revolution. There were something like an estimated 2,500 Jews, maybe some more, maybe some less, in the United States at the time of the Revolution. Uh, there were very few Jews in the United States. And by the same token, Jews were not an important part of the debates of the Revolution. It's very different from, let's say, the French Revolution, uh, where, where Jews were, uh, were intensely debated. The status, the legal status of Jews were intensely debated by the National Assembly in France. In the case of the American Revolution and the uh, constitutional conventions, Jews were not discussed. Article 6 was not drafted really with Jews in mind, uh, uh, and the same with the First Amendment. So, so Jews were not at the center of this, of this revolution, the American Revolution, but in, if it had few immediate practical implications, it did set the religious, uh, sorry, the legal constitutional framework that would define the status of American Jews for f up, up till the present day. And for that reason, it's very, very important. Um, it meant that Jews, subsequent generations of Jews, as the numbers of Jews grew, that they entered into a country in which they could achieve, uh, attain civil and political equality just by becoming citizens. Right? This was, again, for most European Jews, something that was unusual. More specifically, the, Rev uh, the Constitution uh, had a couple of important effects on the way American Jews organized their community and defined themselves. The first was it made Jewish affiliation voluntary. Those passages in the Constitution meant that Jews had complete freedom as to whether they wanted to, uh, what kind of synagogue or other Jewish community organization they wanted to join or if they wanted to join any. That's the key implication in terms of internal Jewish life, not Jewish Jews vis-a-vis -vis the state, but Jews within their own community. That's what um, um, uh, Article 6, that's what the First Amendment uh, meant for them. 
They could establish synagogues of one kind or another. They could organize them how they wanted. And one could identify with or belong to a synagogue or some other community or not. Right? Voluntarism became a guiding aspect, a fundamental aspect of American Jewish life from there on in. This made for a plurality of organizations, or if you like, a fragmentation of Jewish life. Right? Jews have traditionally seen this in two different ways, this voluntarism. Some view it as a wonderful opportunity for Jews to define for themselves what it means to be Jewish, and uh, the multiplicity of ways of doing that is seen by some who think this is a good situation as pluralism at its finest, where others who are concerned about this voluntarism and, and what it means um, as a kind of fragmentation, is creating the, the grounds for fragmentation. I will not delve into that debate here. We can talk about that later. The issues are still the questions, uh, debates, arguments, and disagreements around voluntarism are very much with us today, especially you can see it very strongly, especially in the divide between Orthodox Judaism, which tends to view this situation as one leading to fragmentation and disunity, uh, but they're not the only ones, and in other more liberal or progressive uh, branches of Judaism that see, that see the voluntarism as actually a wonderful, um, a wonderful framework that allows for the best aspects of Judaism to come forth. So, um, uh, so the revolution, was the American Revolution was crucial in those two ways, in granting citizens or enabling citizenship immediately, and at the same time, uh, reconstituting the basis of Jewish collective life along the lines, again, of voluntarism and pluralism. I should just say as a qualifying note that uh, this did not, the Constitution, the Revolution, the Constitution which followed, did not necessarily apply to all Jews everywhere. This applied to Jews at the federal level. Article 6 applied to Jews at the federal level. There were some Jews that did not give Jews full political rights right away. The most famous case, arguably, is Maryland, uh, which, uh, which um, required a Christian oath um, from office holders. It was not until 1826 in which uh, uh, um, uh, legislation that was referred to, a piece of legislation that was referred to uh, informally as the Jew Bill, uh, removed that restriction. So in the case of Maryland, it wasn't until 1826 that Jews had equal political rights. So it meant that if you were a Jew in Maryland, you could theoretically become the president of the United States without con conversion to Christianity, but you could not become the local mayor of you know, Baltimore. Uh, until after 1826. I think it wasn't until 1871 when the last state in, in the United States removed a religious requirement. I think that was Vermont, if I'm not mistaken. So um, there, are this, there, there are exceptions to what I just said, in other words. Uh, but ultimately, there was an alignment between the state and federal levels when it came to um, uh, um, a political and religious freedom. So that set the framework and that has existed till the present day, even though separation of church and state is always something that is negotiated and challenged and so forth. The second revolution, 1848, is important in my mind as a kind of filling out of the first revolution. The revolutions of 1848, failed, mostly failed revolutions in which liberal revolutionaries, revolutionaries against monarchies, um, uh, resulted in the failure, the collapse of those revolutions in Germany and Austria-Hungary sent many, many thousands of, of uh, Germans, um, uh, Jewish and not, mostly not Jewish, to the United States where they um, could live in a political democracy. What's important from the Jewish perspective of Jewish history is that many liberal Jews came to the United States, and some revolutionaries, you know, more radical revolutionaries came, but more specifically is this revolution brings to America the first cohort of reform rabbis. There were almost, uh, there, there was not any rabbi, there were not any rabbis in America until the early 1840s. It's 1843 that sees the first rabbi come to the United States. Before that, Jewish life is organized by lay people. Uh, who with greater or lesser degrees of knowledge in Torah and so forth. They ran synagogues from the, from the beginning of Jewish life in the colonies through the early revolutionary period and in, into the mid-19th century. And it's only in the 1840s and especially after 1848 that rabbis arrive. Now, why are these rabbis important? On one level, they're simply important because they, they, they uh, ele elevate any congregation with a more learned uh, figure. 
But what's more pertinent, I think, for this theme of revolution is that the reform rabbis, most of them were reformed. Some came over, or some Orthodox came over. Many did not. Many uh, tried to resist coming to the United States. That's another story. But Orthodox rabbis were very hesitant to come to the United States. But reform rabbis really uh, embraced the United States quite vigorously in this period because they saw the United States is setting the perfect ground uh, that liberalism uh, American liberalism laid the perfect groundwork for Reform Judaism. So they viewed, they viewed the United States as really a wonderful um, uh, place to experiment with Judaism. What the rabbis did, the Reform rabbis did in this setting uh, is articulate what hadn't really been articulated by Jewish leaders prior to the post-1848 uh, uh, period. And that is, they defined what Judaism meant collectively and formally and what Jewish identity should mean in the United States. And this is what the reform rabbis did between 1848 and 1885 when uh, uh, an assembly of reform rabbis met in Pittsburgh to draw up a list of principles called the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Platform that defined, again, what Judaism, that the essentials of Judaism were, and who Jews were or should be in the United States from there on in. Now, I should pause for a moment before I turn to one or two examples of what they did and how important it was. There were, Judaism was not static in America before the rabbis came. In fact, it changed. It was changing quite progressively. But change was on an ad hoc basis and in a synagogue here, a congregation there around the United States. The changes had to do with things like men and women seating next to each, sitting next to each other, for instance. Whether or not a synagogue should have an organ in it. Should there be stained glass or not? Should there be an English sermon or not? You know, these were the questions of how to surrounding how to adapt Judaism to the United States, and they were, they were debated, argued, figured out by the congregants themselves. The congregants themselves were empowered to do so because the Constitution invested power in anyone to make decisions about Judaism among themselves, and because, as I said before, there were no rabbis here to assert their authority anyway. But when, with the, when the, the reform rabbis started coming after 1848, they were interested, they were thinking in terms of theology, in terms of um, Torah, in terms of tradition, and what a authentic Judaism adapted to American conditions might be. And so the notions of Judaism they came up with was this. The basic idea is expressed in two passages I'm going to read to you. This is one. Quote, we recognize in the Mosaic legislation a system of training the Jewish people for its mission during its national life in Palestine. And today we accept as binding only its moral laws and maintain only such ceremonies as elevate and sanctify our lives, but reject all such as are not adapted to the views and habits of modern civilization. There's a lot, end quote, there's a lot packed in there. The first thing is a discarding of law of halakha, Jewish law, is worked out by generations of rabbis in accordance with uh, the Talmud, interpretations of the Talmud, and so forth. The rabbis in, in Pittsburgh got together and say, no, Jewish law made sense when Jews had their own country, their own commonwealth in Palestine, but they haven't had that since the destruction of the temple. Those laws are not applicable anymore. In one line, they revolutionized Jewish life by saying the, the laws don't apply anymore. So what is Judaism? Judaism is moral teachings. That's what it is. And if the laws don't help elevate our moral, um, our moral bearing, then we can ignore them altogether. So that's one thing that's, that was stated. So what is Judaism without the law? And who are the Jews without the law? Let me read the second passage. Quote, we recognize in the modern era of universal culture of heart and intellect the approaching of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among all men. We consider ourselves, listen to this line, we consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community. 
and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine nor a sacrificial worship of, 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 under the sons of Aaron nor the restoration of any laws concerning the Jewish state. So first, they have redefined Judaism to be about morality, not about law. Second, they say Jews are not a nation anymore. They're a religious community. Why do they say this? In part, they say it because the legal status of Jews as established by the Constitution implies that Jews are not a nation because Jews belong to the American nation. That's what the Constitution allows for. So in fact, Jews belong to the American nation as the Constitution defines it. The reform rabbis are saying, yeah, that's right. right? We're members of that nation. So what are they? We're no longer a nation. They say we're a religious community, a religious community that's voluntarily constituted along moral principles that have nothing to do necessarily with law. This is a radical reconstitution of Jewish life. Many of these ideas were formulated in Germany, but in Germany they couldn't be implemented or not to the same extent for, for various reasons, some of which have to do with the fact there's no separation of church and state in the German states at that time. And orthodoxy had the upper hand there. So what the rabbis did in, the, in Pittsburgh is articulate in Judaic terms what was already legally established by the revolution for Jews. It gave it, they gave it a reality that was coming into existence on an ad hoc way at the grassroots, a principled basis and a coherent outlook. Even though there weren't many of these rabbis, we're talking about a couple dozen, there weren't that many there. They were important because they wrote articles and gave sermons and wrote prayer books and on and on and educated their congregants and their children in these ideas. So when American Jews said to themselves or when others asked them, what are you Jews? Who are you? What do you believe in? They could now say, instead of saying, well, we're not sure, we're a little of this or that, I don't know, don't bother me. You know, I have to make a, you know, I've got to open the store and make a living. Now, now we have rabbis saying, this is who you are. This is where you come from. This is where you're at now. You're Americans of the Jewish faith. That's what the reform rabbi uh, said. And it became the foundational principles of reform Judaism, which of course was the largest branch of Judaism in the United States in the by the second half of the 19th century. That's the meaning, as I would see it, is the second, of that second revolution, the 1848 revolution, that brings rabbis over with a set of ideas about Judaism, mostly formulated in Germany, but now applied with full force in the United States. And most Jews embrace this because it makes sense to their lives in the United States. Again, it, 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 it accords with their, their legal status and what their aspirations are. Most want to be equal American citizens. They don't want to be part of a nation. They don't want to yearn for a return to Palestine. As it says here, the messianic hope of the Jews has been replaced. It's now replaced by enlightenment, justice, and peace among all men in America. That's what messianism has now been redefined by the rabbis to mean. Let's jump ahead to the third revolution, the Russian Revolution of 1905. Uh, without going into the details of that revolution, what's important about this revolution is that it brings over many more Jews who have radically different notions of Judaism, Jewish culture, and Jewish peoplehood compared to the previous generation of Central German and Central European Jews and the Reform rabbis who led them. What this revolution did is bring by the thousands Russian Jews who had just gone through a revolution that failed and had given up on Russia as a place for Jews in the future. Came to these people, came to the United States with notions about Jewish identity that are based on secular ideas, not religious, and some combination of nationalist ideas and socialist ideas. Everything these, this generation believed flew in the face of Reform Judaism, which they ridiculed quite often. If religious Jews, uh, Reform Jews said, uh, Jews are, are Americans of the Jewish faith. This new generation, the post-1905 generation, said several things. A, Jews are a nation. No matter where they live, they're a nation. 
Second, what makes them a nation is their culture, not necessarily their religion. In fact, whatever positive role religion may have played in the past no longer obtains. And what defines Jews now in the 20th century is culture and language. Yiddish language for most, some Hebrew, some Yiddish and Hebrew, it depends who you talk to. Their food ways, their literature, their folk ways, their traditions of one way or another, their food, I said mentioned food, all these things make Jews a nation according to this generation. So this generation, who, some of whom were Zionists, some of whom were, belonged to a party called the Bund, Revolutionary Marxist Party, some of whom were territorialists, meaning they wanted a Jewish homeland, but not necessarily in Palestine. It could be in any number of places. Um, all these people came by the thousands with some combination of nationalism, secularism, socialism as constitutive elements of Jewish peoplehood in the United States. And again, you can see how they flew in the face of everything the 19th century reformers were trying to build. Now, you might say this, this makes no sense in the United States. Jews are legally not a nation in the United States. How can you claim that? Well, the leading th thinkers of this generation, such as someone I'm confident to say no one's ever heard of, such as Chaim Zhitlovsky, who I consider the most influential Jewish leader of the 20th century that you've never heard of. Zhitlovsky, a leader of a party called the Socialist Revolutionaries in Russia, founder of that party, came to the United States uh, with a full-blown theory of Jewish, specifically Yiddish cultural nationalism. The way he dealt with the dissonance between the, his theory of nationalism, the Jews are a nation, Yiddish is their language, the purpose in the future, the, the, the goal in the future should be to reconstitute to Jewish nationality built around an atheistic understanding of Jewish history using the Yiddish language in the service or in conjunction with socialism, right? It's a big load, this, this agenda. Um, his, he said to the reformed Jews, look, America's not a melting pot. Uh, yes, we have equal rights, we have citizenship rights, but doesn't mean, citizenship doesn't mean we ought to assimilate into a melting pot because first and foremost, there is no real melting pot. America is, he said, a nation of nationalities. And that idea appealed to a lot of people in the post-1905 generation. The idea that America is not a monocultural society. America is made up of a, of a host of immigrant groups speaking their different languages. And this is actually the, the sociological reality of America, not some abstract uh, uh, notion of how a society ought to be organized as a melting pot. So he totally rejected that view. He said, this is a nation of nationalities. What holds America together are two things, our diversity and shared notions of freedom, individual freedom and democracy, that yes, the Constitution grounds, but if you understand freedom correctly, said Chaim Zhitlovsky, then you know that freedom applies to individuals. They can opt out of the community or they can join, but it also applies, he said, to nations. Freedom, there's freedom for individuals, but there's also freedom for nations. And if you understand freedom properly, unlike the reform rabbis who don't understand it properly, if you understand that properly, then you will know Jews have the right in America to constitute themselves as a nation within a nation. That is what he wanted, with Yiddish as the main cultural uh, core of what this Jewish nation should be. That was the post-1905 idea that many, not just Zhitlovsky, but a whole array of these revolutionaries who came to the United States brought with them. And what they did in the United States was build a whole movement of Yiddish schools that were secular, non-religious schools, but in the Yiddish language. They built the Yiddish cultural movement, Yiddish publishing houses, Yiddish theater, uh, uh, Yiddish newspapers, Yiddish cultural clubs, right, all these sorts of things. A culture that barely exists anymore, but one that was quite potent and, and vibrant in its own period. So the legacy of the post-1905 generation was first to redefine what a Jew and Jewishness is, and second to build an alternative Jewish culture, alternative to the one that had took, taken shape in the 19th century with the Reformed synagogue being its cornerstone. 
the fourth revolution, the communist, the, the Bolshevik revolution of October 1917, was different from the other three. And it was different from the previous three I mentioned because it was successful. Well, sorry, I should say the other two, 1848 and 1905, because it was successful. The communists seized power, they built a socialist country. Uh, when I say successful, I'm not endorsing the Bolsheviks. I'm saying it was successful because they achieved power. Uh, that's my definition of success here. And what that meant, the, the immediate repercussion in the United States was the rise of the Communist Party, a party that was created to enact the Bolshevik Revolution on American shores. Now this was not a Jewish party, of course, although anti-Semites often saw it that way, but it was a party that included a high number of Jews proportionally to other groups. I'll go to a moment of why this was the case. But what I want to say is about this revolution is it presented a challenge to American uh, ideas of um, democracy and capitalism. Right? That was the first time now for Jews, not only Jews, but for Jews in the United States where they pre presented with a radical alternative, whether it's good or bad, I'm leaving aside. I'm just saying there was a radical alternative presented to them that many chose as an option that the United States was no longer, in the eyes of a good number of Jews between 1917 and the 1940s, the heyday of communism. It was no longer the United States is the basic framework, it's the Soviet model for many. So there's now two alternative ways of being American for Jews. One is a revolutionary socialist way, and another would be within the American paradigm set by the Constitution. Why was this attractive to Jews? More actually, more so than non-Jews. This is a very touchy issue, I'll just say, because it's so wrapped up with anti-Semitism, as we're going to see in a moment. Uh, so it's very touchy in, historically to talk about the relationship of Jews with communism, and I'll go so far as to say it's even more touchy in other countries, in Poland, in Hungary, in Russia, in the Ukraine, among Ukrainians in Canada. Uh, some of whom demand reparations from the Jews for their support for communism. That's an extreme Ukrainian nationalist position. Uh, so this is very controversial, uh, the subject. Uh, but there were several reasons. One, the pogroms. Jews were slaughtered uh, on, 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 on a horrific scale between 1918 and 1920. Perhaps as many as 200,000 Jews were slaughtered by counter-revolutionaries, and it was the Red Army, uh, although it did not always have his hands clean, uh, stopped this slaughter from happening. So there was a sense of gratitude, a feeling that with, it, was, it was the Bolsheviks that saved Jews from total destruction, at least in Ukraine. All right. That's one reason of support for the revolution. Another is that the USSR appeared to solve the Jewish, what was called the Jewish question, meaning the status and future, status of Jews in a given society, in their future, the revolution seemed to satisfy all, uh, the Jewish question, solve the Jewish question rather, in nearly all its iterations. It gave Jews individual rights, right? Jews achieved equality in Russia through the revolution. They achieved national cultural rights, meaning the, the Bolsheviks recognized Jews as a nation. That's what Shetlovsky wanted. That's what the Bundes wanted. And once they had national rights, they had the rights to create their own Yiddish school system, even a court system, uh, uh, research centers and universities, state-sponsored Yiddish theater. Ultimately, and this is a third aspect in the way it solved a Yiddish, the Jewish problem, established a territorial base for Jews in the form of, a, of the Jewish autonomous region in the far eastern part of the Soviet Union known as Berobijan. So there's a third way in which if you were a communist or inclined or sympathetic to, so, to, to the Soviet Union, inclined to see uh, Jew, the Soviet Union as solving the Jewish problem. Equal rights, national cultural rights, and territorial rights. You know, take your pick. Depending on what Jew you were, you could find some way in which the situation of the world's second largest Jewish community was, was solved. If you were, again, you, one could see it that way. You could not see it that way, too. But, but I'm, I'm trying to explain what the, the appeal was to large numbers of Jews. It seemed that the Jewish situation was solved. The only issue the Soviet Union did not solve and could not solve was the idea of Jewish statehood in Palestine. But even there, the Soviet Union, which was officially anti-Zionist, 
wound up playing a very active role, arguably a crucial role, in the establishment of the State of Israel between 1947 and 1949 by supporting Israel in the United Nations and, and uh, encouraging communist Czechoslovakia to arm Israel at a moment when Israel was losing its war for independence. So even in that way, the revolution uh, in the eyes of many Jews, not just communists, had, had served as the protector uh, of, and, uh, of Jews once again in 1948 as it had in 1918 and 1920. I'm gonna, skip, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just drive this point home because it may seem counterintuitive from our perspective in the 21st century that the Soviet Union could be seen in the way I'm describing it uh, by uh, saying some comments about the figure of Leon Trotsky. Leon Trotsky, of course, as you know, was the founder of the Red Army, the second most important person in the revolution after Vladimir Lenin himself, a man who had lived in New York City for 10 weeks in 1917 prior to the revolution and was someone who was quite known to American Jews for all these reasons. Trotsky himself, of course, never saw himself as a Jew. He never denied that he was Jewish, but it was not a positive identity for him. But Jews saw Trotsky, many Jews saw Trotsky in a very different way, in a very interesting way. Um, and I want to read to you three quotes by observers, four quotes, by an observer, uh, observers of the revolution, and specifically comments on Trotsky as a way of, 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 of illustrating to you what the revolution meant in the eyes of many Jews. Um, here's a quote from someone named Boris Bogan. He was a Jewish communal leader and philanthropist. Uh, who went to Russia for a short period of time around the time of the revolution. And this is his comment on Trotsky. Quote, I who had been born in the old Russia and had lived it, in it until my young manhood felt myself in Russia, a uh, revolutionary Russia, I felt myself in a topsy-turvy world in which the despised had come to sit on the throne and they who had been the least were now the mightiest. Where homage was once for the Tsars, the heavens are rent with hoarse, exultant tributes for the Jew, Trotsky, the idol of the people, end quote, right? So he's looking at a country that was anti-Semitic to its core, and now the world had turned upside down in this new revolution of Russia's, and it was Trotsky, a Jew, who was on top. That's, that's his point here. Here's another comment. This is by a journalist, a Zionist, uh, uh, activist and journalist uh, by the last name Malamed. And he's commenting on how Trotsky's indifferent to his Jewishness. But Malamed says, actually, his indifference to his Jewishness is, 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 a mis is a misunderstanding of Trotsky's Jewishness. Trotsky is actually a, embodies a Jewish spirit. And, and listen, listen to what he says. Quote, Leon Trotsky is a universalist in his revolutionary aspirations because he is the incarnation of the wrath, anger, and bitterness of a race, the Jewish race, of a race tortured since the destruction of the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, end quote. So as Malamed has it, he is Jewish because he's, he's, his revolutionary militancy is an outpouring of rage that had accumulated in the Jewish people for all these centuries, and now it's coming out in this revolutionary furor. So yes, he's in, on one level, he's a universalist who doesn't care about his Jewishness in any, in, at all. But on another level, he is, the, he is the, the embodiment of Jewish experience, now come to power. And in that regard, he is very much uh, not only a symbol of the Jewish people, but what the revolution means to the Jewish people. Another, I'm just going to give you a couple more quotes because it, it's so, well, I'll give you just one more. Another comes from a Yiddish journalist named Zaks. He was an educator in the United States, a Jewish educator and political activist. And he writes, quote, I wish that many radical Jews like Trotsky were heads of government. Our foes would then have gnashed their teeth and foamed with rage, but they would not have dared to touch us, uh, let alone perpetrate massacres and pogroms against us. The Jewish Bolsheviks demonstrate, be, Jewish communists, Jewish Bolsheviks demonstrate before the entire world that the Jewish people has not yet degenerated and that this ancient people is still alive and full of vigor. If a people can produce men who can undermine the foundation of the world and strike terror into the hearts of countries and governments, then it is a good omen for itself, a clear sign of its youthfulness, its vitality, and stamina, end quote. So in this reading of Trotsky, he is a sign of health and, and vitality of the Jewish people. 
Communism here is a renaissance for the Jewish people, and Trotsky symbolizes it and guarantees it, according to Zacks, because he's the commander of the Red Army. He will kill you. That's what he's saying. He will shoot you. His soldiers will kill you without asking questions if you lift a finger to harm the Jews. That's what Zacks is saying. Part of this is, of course, a projection. These are projections to some degree, but it's based on reality because anti-Semitism was indeed ruthlessly stamped out by the Red Army. It was understood as if you say anything anti-Semitic, that means you're a counter-revolutionary. If you're a counter-revolutionary, we will kill you. And if you read some of the more me memoirs of young Jews, teenagers who lived through this, they, they say things like, I remember Trotsky coming through our town on a train. And here was he you know, giving orders and making commands and organizing things. And I said, this, this is, according to these, these memoirs, this is why I knew I was going to be a Bolshevik. Right? Because this is what a Jew is doing. Right? This is what it means for the Jew. The revolution was much more complicated, of course, than this. I'm trying to give you a sense of what it meant in the eyes of a good number of American Jews as the revolution was unfolding. Now, I'll say just one more thing about this, because the revolution and the idea that Jews are coming to power through the revolution and its implications in the United States. One implication is what I was just suggesting. A good, a significant minority of Jews become communists. And in becoming communists, they set themselves up as, a, for the first time, a force in America that uh, wants imminent revolution, immediate revolution. The flip side of that is it meant there was a new kind of anti-Semitism that emerged exactly at this time and in response. And this was the anti-Semitism of those people, this wide, good number of these people in the United States, who viewed the revolution as Jewish but Jewish in a sense that it's a conspiracy by Jews for Jews against Western civilization. And, uh, uh, and, and so that the, the, the comments I just read to you, if these anti-Semites heard these comments, they were written in Yiddish, so they, most of them were written in Yiddish, so they couldn't hear them. But if they heard them, they would have seized upon every quote I just gave you and said, here's the evidence of what the Jews are doing. This is why the revolution is Jewish. So I'll read to you, I'll read to you a testimony from, uh, before the Senate by Reverend George Simons, former superintendent of the Methodist Episcopal Church in Russia and Finland. He's testifying before Senate in 1919, and this is what he said about the revolution. Um, the pr quote, the present chaotic conditions in Russia are due in large part to the activities of the Yiddish agitators from the Lower East Side of New York. That's, of course, the, the main Jewish uh, section of, the United, of New York. Uh, of, of the Yiddish agitators from the East Side of New York City who went to Russia immediately following the downfall of the Tsar. These Yiddish agitators from the New York East Side followed the trail of Trotsky, who was himself on the east side at the time of the Tsar's overthrow. That's in front of Senate. I'll, the Senate, I'll read you a, a more important quote, and this is from the Attorney General, George Mitchell Palmer. Right? This is a man of consequence. He's the eternal Attorney General of the United States. And he blamed the revolution, quote, on a small clique of outcasts from the Lower East Side of New York. Uh, uh, he, and he said, uh, he asked rhetorically Palmer, because a disreputable, I'm quoting, because a disreputable alien, Leon Bronstein, the man who now calls himself Leon Trotsky can inaugurate a reign of terror from his throne room in the Kremlin because this lowest of all types known to New York can sleep in the Tsar's bed while hundreds of thousands in Russia are without food and shelter. Should Americans be swayed by such communist doctrines? The answer was no. Um, so that's, that's the end of the quote. So this idea emerged very quickly that there was a New York uh, Russian access axis, that Jews are behind it, that the revolution is serving them, they're inspiring it, they're creating the chaotic conditions there, and, and so Jews are at the very center of this. Now, this is new in American Jewish history. There had been anti-Semitism in American society, but not like this. There was country club anti-Semitism. You can't come to our club, you can't come to our hotel because you're Jewish, you can't live in our neighborhood. But this idea of an international conspiracy driven by Jews to undermine capitalism, civilization, Christendom, take your pick, now places Jews in the United States in a very uncomfortable position. They're now seen as a security threat. 
to the United States. For the first time in American Jewish history, and I say this as a second important consequence of the 1917 revolution. The first, again, the attraction of Jews to the Communist Party, and the second, this anti-Semitism uh, that I'm describing. The final revolution I'll point to is 1948 in the creation of the State of Israel. This was, of course, not a revolution in the sense that an existing regime or social order was overthrown. It was a revolution in the sense, first, that the colonial power, Great Britain, was kicked out of the country in large measure because of the Zionists there, and second, because it was a constructive revolution, which is to say a new kind of society based in large measure on cooperative and socialist ideas was put in place and finally Jews achieved statehood for the first time since 70 AD. This is again a new radical set of circumstances that Jews found themselves in. The implications were still the implications of this revolution, of this, the Zionist revolution, are still unfolding. So um, I, I, what I'm saying now is quite limited. Uh, but I would say there are these. First, American Jews who at the start of the 20th century were mostly indifferent to the Zionist project, think of Reform Judaism, right? uh, throw, overwhelmingly throw their weight behind it, regardless of whether they think of themselves as died in the wool Zionists in every respect. But the idea of, Jewish statehood and nation building is the, um, this is the goal, aspiration, ideal of the majority of Jews from the communist left all the way to uh, the, the Republican right. There weren't many of them, uh, but, but you know, the, 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 in the Jewish community. Uh, but, but the spectrum of Jewish life, which is really communism to liberalism at that, at that period of time. Uh, so that's one immediate uh, uh, result. A second corresponding result is uh, that Israel culturally begins to influence American Jewish life. Yiddish recedes not only because of Israel. Hebrew is the, the, the lang increasing the language of Jewish education in the United States. But Israeli music, Israeli dance, Israeli food becomes part of the Jewish cultural repertoire um, over, over time. So there's a cultural realignment of American Jews away from Eastern Europe, or, of course, uh, 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 not strictly limited to America either, but tilted towards uh, the new Hebrew-speaking culture that is coming to being in the state of Israel. Second, and off, that's an obvious point, but the second, and I think often uh, not recognized, is the way the rise of the state of Israel more closely aligns Jews with American foreign policy. Let me just say a word about that. I already indicated that uh, Jewish foreign policy interests weren't always the same as Americans. And as much as most Jews wanted the Bolsheviks to succeed, if only because the alternative seemed to be horrifying, the alternative would have been continued slaughter by the counter-revolutionary armies, most Jews put themselves at odds with the mainstream of America. When they said, we want the Bolsheviks to win this war, they were putting themselves at odds. Another example in which Jews found themselves at odds with American foreign policy was during the 1930s and 40s, when Jews, when the immigration restriction laws that were put in place in 1924 was, um, was uh, preventing the rescue of refugees from Nazis to come to the United States. So that Jews who, of course, wanted an open door policy or at least a liberal immigration regime couldn't get that from either Congress or the president and were, were in tension with, were in tension with, with, with American foreign policy and with large segments of the population who believed Jews were trying to drag the United States into war against Nazism for their own benefit and against American national interests. Yet another important foreign policy issue in which Jews were not part of the mainstream. 1948, even at the beginning of this, the, the Israeli statehood, the United States was unsure about this. Should the United States back Israel? Is it good for the United States? Would it put the United States at odds with Arab countries? Could Israel win this war? All right, the United States waffled and tried to stay neutral as possible and eventually supported Israel, but, but for a good 20 years afterwards, the United States had cordial relationship, a cordial relationship with Israel, but not a close one. After around 67, it becomes quite close. And this brings me back to my point that one long-term result of 
the, of Jewish statehood, of the Zionist revolution, is to move Jews into an alignment with American foreign policy once the United States comes to view Israel as a reliable, dependable, and productive ally. Uh, there's more to be said about this, but I think that sets a new kind of relationship and status, uh, between Jews and the country in which they live in the largest numbers and, um, and a larger society as well. There's more to be said about the state of Israel, as I say, but I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to leave it. Uh, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to move towards a conclusion. And so in conclusion, I'd say that these currents, the three currents that I discussed, uh, liberalism, socialism in its various forms, and nationalism, Jewish nationalism in its various forms, have shaped American Jewish politics over the long term. Each of those ideologies, as they were translated into Jewish communal life, arose in connection, I try to suggest, in successful revolutions, 1848, 1905, 1917, and 1948. Some of those revolu revolutions succeeded, some failed, although I, I, how to measure success and failure is tricky. Uh, it's not easy, it's not always clear what's successful or what success means. But nonetheless, the, 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 let's say the trajectories of these revolutions, especially the Russian Revolution and the Zionist Revolution of 1948, has resulted over time in, uh, in, in, in a heightening of uh, utopian aspirations at some moments, the idea that a radically new and better world could be created in the here and now. These, these revolutions have inspired that in Jewish life in really strong, terms, and at the same time, these revolutions have at times caused painful dis disappointments with the realization that the Soviet Union wasn't what we hoped it would be or thought it was. Or more recently, uh, a good number of people, especially young people, who, who, who have come to conclude that uh, the, the uh, Jewish statehood has not produced uh, the kind of country uh, they thought or think it should be. All right, so again, we've had these kind of successive waves of utopianism and disappointment that have come out of these revolutions. And I would say many of these remain with us today, these feelings, these attitudes, these, these, these legacies that I've been trying to sketch uh, remain to this day, even in our decidedly unrevolutionary era of the 20th century. Uh, just as a final thought, what all of this means, what these revolutions that have accumulated and ro risen and fallen and so forth, what it means for the future of American Jews, that I can't determine. But I'm quite sure their legacies remain with us, and I'd be interested in exploring some of these with you in the Q&A. So thank you very much.